right. Good morning. Well, my name is Alan, and I'm the pastor here, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to worship, whether you're in person or watching on the rebroadcast on YouTube. We just have a few announcements this morning, first of which is our adult Sunday school that meets every Sunday um, at 9.30 in the parlor. So you're welcome to join them. They are reading through the book of Acts. The Sermon Club meets Wednesdays at 10.30, and that's a time where we discuss the previous and upcoming week's sermons. Always a good time to catch up on your pleasures. Our Men's Great Banquet is this weekend. Um, it begins on Thursday evening. There's still room for you. So if you want to join us for that men's weekend, you can certainly join us. And we would be happy to have you. Our women's weekend is next weekend, November 9th through the 12th. And there's room for you there as well. We'll be welcoming new members on November 19th during worship. So you'll want to make sure to mark your calendars to join us as we receive new members into our church family. And we're really excited about welcoming them into our family. Any other announcements this morning? I've got a few prayer concerns to get us started. First of all, uh, Debbie is having her appendix out on Tuesday. So you want to make sure to pray for Debbie um, as she has that procedure done and will be in the hospital a couple of days. And Emily is currently in labor. So keep she and Luke in your prayers during this special time for them and pray that all goes well. Any other joys or concerns? Betty? <laughs> so we pray for Emma on her special day. Other joys or concerns? Yep. Oh. So we pray for Christina. Other joys or concerns? All right, seeing none, we'll invite Charlie to share his prelude.
Good morning. Stand if you're able for the call to worship. We are invited to share in Christ's ministry of compassion. We will our hearts so we might pray the lost. We are challenged to learn more about God each day. We will open our minds so we might discern God's dreams for us. We are summoned to let the Spirit be planted in us. We will deepen our souls so we might grow in love. confession of sin. As you know, God our healer, we stand on the edge of your promises and hopes, yet cannot seem to let ourselves cross over into the life you intend for us. We seek praise from our families, yet are unable to tell them how much we love them. We care more about our needs and desires than for the struggles of our neighbors. We think more about the trash we read and see than focusing on the spirit of wisdom. Forgive us, everlasting God. Renew our lives with your grace. Restore our hopes with your vision of tomorrow. Refresh our spirits with your joy, which comes to us new in each moment in the gift of your child, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The good news is that God forgives us. Forgive others and forgive yourselves. Thanks be to God. reading is from 1st Kings chapter 12 verses 1 through 17. Rehoboam went to Shechem for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. When Jeroboam son of Nebat heard of it for he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon then Jeroboam returned from Egypt and they sent and called him and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, your father made your yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke that he placed on us and we will serve you. He said to them, go away for three days, then come again to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the older men who had attended his father Solomon while he was still alive, 
saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? They answered him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good (coughs) words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he disregarded the advice that the older men gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and now attended him. He said to them, What do you advise that we answer this people who have said to me, Lighten the yoke that your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus you should say to this people who spoke to you, Your father made your yoke heavy, but you might lighten it for us. Thus you should say to them, My little finger is thicker than your father's loins. Now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king had said, Come to me again on the third day. The king answered the people harshly. He disregarded the advice that the older men had given him and spoke to them according to the advice of young men. My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, because it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ajah and Shalonite to Jeroboam, son of Nepal. Nabal. When all Israel saw that the king would not listen to them, the people answered the king, What share do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Look now to your own house, O David. So Israel went away to their tents, but Rehoboam resigned, reigned over the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah.
Our second reading continues in 1 Kings chapter 12, picking up with verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and resided there. He went out from there and built Penuel. Then Jeroboam said to himself, Now the kingdom may well revert to the house of David. If these people continue to go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, the heart of this people will turn again to their master, King Rehoboam of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. He said to the people, you have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, open our ears to hear you. Open our minds to know you. Open our mouths to praise you, open our hearts to love you, and open our lives to serve you. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Lord Acton is credited with the following quote. Power tends to corrupt. An absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men, even when they exercise influence and not authority. Still more when you add the tendency of the certainty of corruption by authority. Today we read the story of two kings who come to power. We remember the story of how Solomon fell from power, how he was corrupted by foreign gods and by the lust for power. And we see how great rulers can fall. And we see in this the tension between servant leadership and self-centered tyranny. Last week, we talked about how David united the monarchy bringing the Ark of the Lord to Jerusalem and establishing it as the political and religious center of all of Israel's, of all of Israel. And Israel enjoyed a time of peace. They were united. They were of one faith and of one people. There was no divide between the northern and the southern kingdom, but all came together under the reign of David. And that continued with his son Solomon, who also ruled a united monarchy. And Solomon was known at first for his wisdom and his shrewdness with dealing with power. But later we learn how he married a thousand foreign wives and started worshiping their gods and set up shrines throughout all of Israel. And he fell from grace, and eventually he died. This week we talk about how the king, kingdom came to be divided again. The prophet Ahijah predicted this would happen in chapter 11. And we must read chapter 11 in order to understand what's going on in chapter 12. This is 1 Kings 11, 29 to 32. About that time when Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him on the road. Ahijah had clothed himself with a new garment. The two of them were alone in the open country. When Ahijah laid a hold of the new garment he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. He then said to Jeroboam, take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, see I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you ten tribes. 
One tribe will remain his for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. So this story is Ahijah's prophecy coming about. We see how the northern tribes are torn away and we get a divided monarchy yet again. We get the 10 tribes of the northern kingdom known as Israel, and we get the one tribe of Judah and the Benjamites as well. Again, this was all precipitated on the death of Solomon, who died of natural causes at a ripe old age, but it caused a vacuum of power. And of the many sons that Solomon must have had, Rehoboam stepped forward and Israel decided to make him for themselves a king. He is ordained at Shechem rather than Jerusalem, which I find odd since Jerusalem was the capital city. But Shechem was an important town in Israel's history. It's the first place that Abraham stopped when he came to the promised land. And it had been considered a sacred shrine and city ever since. The people came to him as they made him king and they said, your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke that he placed on us and we will serve you. In chapter four, it is inferred that there must have been extreme taxation in Israel for Solomon to keep up his lifestyle. And his was an extravagant lifestyle. And so we imagine how he was able to sustain that was by extreme taxation on the people. But then in chapter 5 is where we read that Solomon put the heavy yoke on his people. He forced them into hard labor. He conscripted 30,000 men, some to work the forests of Lebanon and some to work the quarries of the hill country. And he put them to work chopping down trees and making lumber. He put them to work quarrying stone, and he did all this so that he could have a grand palace. All of this forced labor was to build Solomon a house. And he did so at the expense and to the extreme circumstances of his citizens. So of course the people were upset. Here they were breaking their backs in heavy service, all to build the king a house. And so they worked hard, and obviously they became bitter, and so they came to Rehoboam and said, make our yoke lighter. Ease the yoke that your father put on us. Now, Rehoboam did the right thing in seeking out counsel. Instead of answering the people on the spot, he said, go away for three days. Let me seek counsel, and then I will give you my decision. First, he seeks out the elders, the older men of Israel who had ruled with Solomon. And they told him, if you will be a servant to this people, today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. Servant leadership was the ideal in the Bible. Servant leadership was how the kings were to rule the people. They were considered shepherds and there's no greater servant metaphor than that of a shepherd tending the flock, not ruling over them. Even Jesus himself lifted up the model of servant leadership. In Matthew chapter 20, he said, 
You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Servant leadership is when you take into consideration the common good. Servant leadership is when you rule according to the people's needs. Servant leadership is when you take into consideration their circumstances. Servant leadership would never enslave anyone. Servant leadership would never inflict them to forced labor. Servant leadership would never oppress or discriminate. Servant leadership lifted up all of the people and came together for the common good. And so the older men gave Rehoboam good advice. The Bible says he didn't take it. Instead, he went to the young men that he had grown up with in the court of Solomon, that he was raised with. He went to his buds for advice. He consulted the young men, and he ended up answering the people as they had suggested. In Verse 13, we read, the king answered the people harshly. He disregarded the advice the older men had given him and spoke to them according to the advice of the young men. My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Not only would Rehoboam not take away the yoke, he vowed to make it harder. And when we read about scorpions, we are meant to think of the whips with barbed metal that were used to punish the people. So not only would he punish the people with whips that his father had, he would punish them with scorpions. And this response was too much for the northern tribes of Israel. And so this response caused the northern tribes to secede from the monarchy. What share do we have in David, they said. We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Look now to your own house, O David. So Israel went away to their tents. And so the kingdom was divided. Rehoboam was left with just the southern tribe of Judah and the Benjamites, while the ten tribes of Israel went to the north and sought out another king. Rehoboam wouldn't let this rebellion stand. He summoned an army and was prepared to invade and bring the kingdom back together. But the Lord stopped him and told them that this was God's will. And so Rehoboam, showing faith for a change, accepted God's will, relented from attacking his brothers and sisters in the northern tribes, and ruled over Judah. Jeroboam came about to rule the northern tribes of Israel just as Ahijah had prophesied to him not long before. He was given ten tribes and he ruled over them. But he proved not much better of a leader than Rehoboam himself, for he became insecure. He thought of the people who were still going to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. And he feared that their religious unity would result in political unity that would cause an uprising. And so Jeroboam fashioned two golden calves, 
One he put in Bethel in the south, the other he put in Dan in the north. And he told the people to worship God there. Canaanite gods were often depicted standing on the backs of calves, standing on the backs of other animals. So he was not asking them to worship the calves themselves. Instead, he was asking them to worship the Lord who stood upon the throne of the calves. Not just that, he set up shrines all throughout Israel so that the people could worship God. Note that Jeroboam's insecurity does not result in idolatry. He is not asking the people to worship anyone but Yahweh, their God. But he's doing so in a way fashioned after the Canaanites. He would go so far as to institute his own festival that he had the Israelites celebrate in honor of Yahweh. He didn't lead the people astray from God. Instead, he set up Canaanite ways of worshiping God, which was akin to idolatry. So what can we learn today? What can we learn from this story? First of all, we learn the importance of servant leadership. We learn the importance of how important it is for us to use our power and influence to meet the needs of others. We learn the importance of seeking out the common good, of doing what we can to provide for the needs of all the people, to provide love and justice and hope and nurture, support and encouragement. We are meant to lead from behind, to lift up people, to encourage them, to help them be the better versions of themselves. And we are called to do our part to make our world one where one person takes care of another and another takes care of another. And in the end, we all learn to take care of each other. We also learn that God is in control even in times of political upheaval. We live in a divided kingdom still. We're divided between Republicans and Democrats. We are divided between conservatives and liberals. And we see the impasse that that results in in our own government. And so we pray for more servant leaders among us. But God is still in control. God can use corrupt, imperfect political systems to bring about God's will for this world. And we still live in a great country, even though we are fragmented by divisions, even though we are beset by hate, and even though we don't see eye to eye. Finally, we must ensure for the proper worship of God and not give in to our idolatries. We must not let the ways of the world corrupt our worship of God. We must be true to God and not to our selfish desires. We are to be true to God and not our lust for money. We are to be true to God and not our lust for power. We should be true to God and not our lust for fame and attention. We should be true to God always and trust that he is always in control. And he shepherds us like a flock. Jesus came in a time of political upheaval. He came under a corrupt Roman tyranny. He came at a time where Jews were divided, where scribes and Pharisees didn't see eye to eye. And meanwhile, the poor, the widow, and the orphan were neglected. But Jesus came to unite the people. 
Jesus came to welcome the strangers. Jesus came to bring people together, not to tear them apart. Jesus came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And it is because of that that we pray for unity in our world today. We look to the Middle East and pray for peace. We look at our homeland and pray for peace here as well. We pray for peace where there is division. We pray for love where there is hatred. We pray for welcome where there is exclusion. And we pray for hope beyond understanding. So let us know that people come together, but they also drift apart. But God is doing what God can to hold us together. So let us hold on to God. Let us hold on to one another. And let us be a united people all under the banner of the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 affirmation of faith which comes from the study catechism what is meant by the second petition your kingdom come we ask God to come and rule among us through faith and love and and justice we We pray pray for both the church and the world that God will rule in our hearts through faith in our personal relationships through love and in our institutional affairs through justice What is meant by the third petition, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Of course, God's will is always done and will surely come to pass, whether we desire it or not. But the phrase, on earth as in heaven, means that we ask for the grace to do God's will on earth in the way that is done in heaven, gladly and from the heart. We yield ourselves in life and in death to God's will.
may be seated. Let us pray. Creator God, who causes the leaves to change and to float about on the air, drifting through a world of beauty. You send the rain to nourish the ground, and you give us bright sunshine to warm our hearts. You gave us this earth as a paradise, and you asked us to take good care of it. So help us not to neglect your creation. Help us not to mar the image in which we were created. And renew the face of the earth with your grace. Redeemer God, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, as a ransom for many. It is because of him that we stand here without guilt or shame. It is because of him that we embrace grace every day of our lives. It is because of him we can move past our failures, we can be made whole even despite our imperfections. He came to this world when it was in turmoil and he brought order to humanity. He gave them the means by which to be saved, by which to be whole, by which to be assured of eternal life. Grace is the powerful declaration that you love us. Grace is the powerful word of hope that you will sustain us. And we pray, sustaining God, that you sanctify us, that you cleanse our hearts, that you renew our minds and spirits, and that you help us to love you with all of our being and to love our neighbor as ourselves so that in our lives, people might see Christ alive in us, that we might be instruments of your love and your peace and your hope in this world that needs so much of it. We pray for the justice that he brings, that it be done to all people so that all may live with basic freedoms and basic rights. We pray for our church. We thank you for new members who are joining us. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you in the many ways that we do. We thank you for our vibrant music program led by Dr. Mitchell and the way they help us to worship you every Sunday morning. We thank you for the tireless efforts of our deacons to help serve us at coffee call, help serve us communion, and help serve us by collecting the offering. Help us to do what we can to help our leaders, for we are all called to be leaders of the church. This is our ministry. Help us to support our session in the decisions that they make and help us to be good stewards of our resources that you have given us. Strengthen our witness. Help us to be evangelists so that we might bring others to you and bring others into our church family. We pray for our nation at this time. We pray against the bitter divisions. We pray for more bipartisan solutions. We pray for servants of the people, not lords and tyrants. We pray for those who look out for the common good, not just their own special interests. We pray for the people of Maine and we pray for an end to gun violence. We pray for those who lead us on the state and local level as well, and we pray for this election cycle that we might elect servant leaders, people who will serve this community on behalf of all the people.
We pray for those out there who are homeless. I pray for Jerry who stopped by this morning and asked that you watch over him and keep him safe. I pray for young Tyler who's been around the church as well and ask that you help him find his way in life. I pray for others who are experiencing homelessness, whether we get to meet them or not. I pray for those who battle addiction and those who love them. I pray for those who are battling cancer, leukemia, and other serious diseases. I pray for our doctors and nurses who take care of them. I pray for those who battle mental illness, especially that which goes untreated. I pray for those who are contemplating suicide and ask that you help us be a light in their darkness if simply by sharing a smile and a word of hope. Lord, I pray for this world. I pray for Israel and Palestine and that you bring peace to a region that has eluded it for many, many years. We see how there has always been conflict in the Middle East, even among siblings. We ask that you protect the innocent civilians who are caught in the crossfire as we pray against the evils of Hamas, Hezbollah, ISIS, and other terrorist organizations. We lift up Debbie as she has surgery on Tuesday. We lift up Emily at this time as she is in labor and ask that you be with Luke as well as he's there to support her. Be with Emma on the special day of her baptism and be with Christina during her pregnancy and as she and her family mourn the loss of her father. Lord, always fill us with hope. Help us know that you are always with us. Help us know that when our lives seem to spiral out of control, you are somehow bringing us order and balance. Keep us mindful of the blessings that you will bestow upon us each and every day. Even if it is for that simple opportunity to live that day to its fullness. Forgive us our doubts. Forgive our lack of faith. Help us with confidence to come to you with our greatest desires and our deepest fears. And now in a time of silence, I invite my brothers and sisters to pray to you as well. Give us wisdom to know that your answers come in your way (coughs) and patience knowing that they come in your time. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence as we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Together let us offer what we are able as our ushers come forward to collect the offering.
Almighty God, you are the giver of all gifts. Take what we are able to offer you this morning and use it to further and sustain the life and mission of this congregation gathered in your name and dedicated to your service. We pray this through Christ who is our head and in his name. Amen. Amen. surround you. May the love of Father God enfold you. May the power of Holy Spirit protect you. And may the presence of God watch over you. And remember wherever you are, God is and all will be well. Go in peace. Amen. 